right, so I think we can get started now. So a very good morning, good evening to one and all present today. I'm Aishu Venkat, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the first episode of the Neurology Webinar Series hosted by the Euroimmune Academy. Today, we are excited to present the topic, Exploring Autoimmune Encephalitis with Adult and Pediatric Cases. This webinar will be divided into two parts. First, Dr. PK will speak about the clinical presentation of autoimmune encephalitis. Afterwards, Dr. Nates will address key technologies used for the detection of various neuroimmunology biomarkers. Towards the end, we also have a panel discussion where you can address all your questions. If you do have any questions, please type them in the chat box on your screen and we will relate to the speakers. Any unanswered questions will be directly answered to you via email. Please see our email address in the chat box so that you're able to address all other questions to us. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Amanda PK as our first speaker. Dr. PK is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado and is the director of the autoimmune neurology program. Her research interests include characterizing biomarkers in autoimmune neurological diseases, which led to her establishing autoimmune neurology clinics and the autoimmune neurological disease registry and biorepository at the University of Colorado. So Dr. D Amanda PK, thank you so much for being our first speaker today and to talk about autoimmune encephalitis. It's my pleasure to welcome you and I'll hand over uh, the microphone as well as the video to you and I'll be controlling your uh, presentation for today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome everybody on the webinar. I am so excited to be able to give off the uh, first kickoff talk in autoimmune neurology. So we're gonna be exploring autoimmune encephalitis today, uh, looking at both adult and pediatric cases. So just to give everyone a little bit of background, first we're gonna review um, the history of autoimmune neurology and the landscape of autoantibody discovery. We're gonna take some time to review the differences between perineoplastic and cell surface antibody syndromes and uh, really dive into some uh, cases of autoimmune encephalitis, again, both in adults and pediatrics. And then at the end, we're gonna summarize, you know, how do we get to the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis? Here is the landscape of neuronal autoantibody discovery. Now, really the idea of perineoplastic or an immune mediated mechanism causing neurologic syndromes in the setting of cancer was actually first described in the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1965 when Dr. Wilkinson and colleagues discovered a neuronal uh, autoantibody in four patients with small cell lung cancer and sensory neuropathy. Then in the 1980s, additional studies began describing specific neuronal antibodies in the context of different antibody syndromes. In 1983, doctors Greenlee and Brashear identified another Purkinje cell antibody in patients with ovarian cancer and cerebellar degeneration. Then in 1985, the group with Dr. Posner at Memorial Sloan Kettering began describing different perineoplastic neurologic syndromes in patients. In uh, 2004, it was really a, another landmark year when NMO uh, or neuromyelitis optica was described in the setting of, of a positive aquaporin-4 antibody with Dr. Van der Linden at the Mayo Clinic. This was one of the first examples of an autoantibody that was truly pathogenic. The field of autoimmune neurology, specifically our understanding of autoimmune encephalitis, then really exploded after the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis, and that was in 2007. And we will get into that a bit later. But briefly, this was described by Professor Dalmau's group in the setting of four young women who developed a syndrome of memory deficits, psychiatric symptoms, decreased level of consciousness, and hypoventilation. They were all found to have ovarian teratomas. Subsequently, NMDA receptor encephalitis was then later described in children, men, and women without teratomas. 
beyond NMDA receptor encephalitis, uh, other antibodies against cell surface and synaptic antigens have been identified with increasing frequency. And these are all highlighted here on this page in red. The discovery of these cell surface antibodies has really shaped the landscape of autoimmune neurology. And it is now recognized that many of these antibody syndromes can be readily treatable with immune therapy. Additionally, the discovery of new neuronal antibodies has really revealed that these conditions are much more common than previously appreciated, and oftentimes patients remain misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. This figure here highlights the difference proposed pathophysiology of antibody-mediated syndromes. In panel A, or otherwise in the black box, also the black color-coded antibodies on the previous slide, this shows the intracellular antibody um, or antigen targets, for example, anti-HU. These antibody syndromes are classically thought to be perineoplastic syndromes, often found in the setting of underlying malignancy. It is thought that this largely represents a T-cell mediated process. Now in panel C or in the red box, uh, you can see that this is your, your uh, classic cell surface antibody syndrome, such as NMDA receptor encephalitis. Here you have the antigen target um, or the antibodies targeting an antigen on the cell surface receptor causing receptor dysfunction. In panel B or in gray, um, a little less common uh, are your intracellular synaptic syndromes, for example, with GAD65. So we're going to kick off now into our cases. Uh, first, we're going to start with a 24-year-old woman who was admitted to a psychiatric facility for paranoia, agitation, disordered uh, or disorganized speech, and insomnia. She had developed fevers, muscle rigidity, tachycardia, or fast heart rate, and hypertension. So she was transferred to the hospital while in the psychiatric facility due to those symptoms. She had further workup with a brain MRI, which was normal. She had a lumbar puncture with a CSF analysis that showed inflammatory uh, CSF, specifically 48 white blood cells. Um, she had a mild elevation in her protein in the spinal fluid, and she had infectious workup, which was largely unremarkable, specifically her HSV PCR was negative. Um, the, despite negative infectious workup, it was thought that this was maybe um, herpes simplex virus or HSV encephalitis. She was treated with IV acyclovir, uh, and transferred back to the psychiatric facility. Unfortunately, she continued to progress clinically. She developed canatotic spells and um, a severe psychosis would often uh, speak of walking with God. She was transferred to a large tertiary care center uh, where we met the patient and had further workup with repeat uh, CSF studies and imaging uh, with a brain PET scan. So here um, in panel B is her brain MRI. And as you could see here, it is, is essentially normal. In panel A, uh, this shows you the abnormal brain PET scan that she had. And what this demonstrates is posterior hypometabolism, which is a common finding in this particular antibody. And so, what this represents, you have the red and the orange areas indicating the highest degree of hypermetabolism, we call it. Um, yellow is intermediate metabolism. And then the green and blue areas respond to low metabolic ac activity. Now, you could see here the relative hypometabolism in the posterior or bilateral occipital lobes when you compare to the frontal lobes, which are bright red. And again, this is consistent with a pattern of frontotemporal to occipital, hyper to hypo metabolic gradient. And this is reported in patients with this particular antibody, which was NMDA receptor encephalitis. Her workup uh, was remarkable for NMDA receptor antibodies found in both the serum and the CSF. She had further appropriate workup with a MRI of the pelvis to rule out a teratoma. Uh, she was treated symptomatically with her catatonia with benzodiazepines and immune therapy was initiated as soon as this diagnosis was confirmed. Uh, she received acute therapy with IVIG 
Uh, three weeks later, she did not have a profound clinical response, so rituximab was initiated uh, quickly. Uh, over the course of two years, she had a slow but complete recovery. Now, as I alluded to earlier, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis was first reported as a perineoplastic process, meaning uh, there was an underlying cancer, and it was young women with ovarian teratomas. Uh, but now we know that these cases can occur in, in women without underlying teratomas. Um, it's been reported in children and men. Uh, this particular antibody syndrome is a pathogenic antibody. Um, there is a highly specific antibody mediated process against the NR1 subunit of the NMDA receptor. And Furthermore, this is the leading cause of autoimmune encephalitis in children and adolescents. In fact, in the California encephali encephalitis project cohort, 65% of the patients were actually under the age of 18 years old. Now, NMDA receptor encephalitis has a very distinct predictable phenotype. Probable NMDA receptor encephalitis can be met when four out of the five, or sorry, four out of the six of the following criteria are present. So this includes a rapid onset, which is defined as less than three months of abnormal or psychiatric behavior. Um, and here I'm gonna list uh, six of the criteria, again, four of these. So the psychiatric behavior, speech abnormalities, seizures, and this is in the setting of no history of underlying seizure disorder, abnormal movements, uh, or decreased level of consciousness. In addition to these clinical features, you should have at least one of the following, which is abnormal, and that is EEG, looking for abnormal seizures, uh, or abnormal activity, including seizures. Uh, and inflammatory spinal fluid or a CSF with pleocytosis. Um, and that is defined as white blood cells greater than five in the spinal fluid or the presence of the oligoclonal bands. To make the diagnosis of definitive NMDA receptor encephalitis, one must have a positive antibody in the CSF. And it is Im important to emphasize here that, that CSF testing really must be done uh, because the CSF antibody testing is more sensitive and specific and is really required to make this diagnosis over just serum testing. Um, so moving on to our next clinical case, we have a pediatric case of a 12-month-old girl. She developed fevers and seizures and was actually appropriately diagnosed with herpes encephalitis or HSV encephalitis. Um, here I outline the timeline of events. When she came in, she had evidence of a inflammatory spinal fluid um, and a positive HSV-1 uh, PCR on her CSF demonstrating the presence of this virus. Uh, she was appropriately treated with 21 days of IV acyclovir. Uh, she started to have improvements over these three weeks, reduction of her seizures um, and clearing of her mental status. Then at week four, she developed worsening seizures. And this new movement disorder uh, described as choreoathetosis in her arms. Um, by, eight week, uh, by eight weeks, she, her seizures became so profound that she was in status epilepticus, admitted to the ICU, and was in um, essentially a coma. She had repeat spinal fluid uh, studies done at that time. The HSV PCR was now negative. Um, and she continued to, to have ongoing seizures and poor neurologic function by 15 weeks in which she was transferred to our facility um, and repeat imaging and CSF studies were done. This is her imaging uh, that was done in panel A shows the initial brain MRI at 48 hours. Uh, you can see here, this is 48 hours after her fevers and seizures and first presentation. You can see here there are T2 hyperintensities involving the periorolandic regions, a little more prominent on the left compared to the right. In panel B and C, uh, B shows our flare MRI. Uh, 
Uh, panel C shows the T2 sequences, and this was at 15 weeks when she was transferred um, to our facility. And you can just see a profound difference. These sequences show significant encephalomalacia around the same region of the original abnormalities, as well as new confluent white matter signal change um, that was very distinct from the original uh, lesions. And just overall, um, you can see a ton of global atrophy compared to the original study. Um, she had repeat CSF done, which demonstrated a positive NMDA receptor antibody in the CSF. And she was subsequently diagnosed with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis as a post-infectious process following HSV encephalitis. Now, historically, as many as 10 to 25% of patients were reported to experience this reoccurrence of neurologic symptoms in the cases of uh, a presumed relapse of HSV encephalitis. But the majority of these cases, um, there was an inability to detect the actual virus in the CSF. And so what was formally and historically described as relapsing HSV encephalitis is actually more likely a post-infectious autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, with NMDA receptor antibodies actually being the most commonly identified. Therefore, it's actually thought that HSV is really a trigger of cell surface or a synaptic autoimmunity. And furthermore, this, this syndrome has been uh, well characterized now and recognizing this clinical syndrome has really led to the development of a mouse model in which mice were inoculated intranasally with HSV one and subsequently developed antibodies to NMDA receptors. So this is a perfect example of taking uh, what we learn in the clinic back to the bench. Uh, moving on to the next case, here we have an older individual. He's 80 years old. Uh, he presented with two weeks of progressive confusion. Uh, just an example that his wife gave is she had to lock him in the house at night because he would get up and start wandering around the neighborhood. Uh, additional symptoms included visual hallucinations, and then he developed these brief twitching movements of his right face and arm, um, and they were occurring multiple times a day. Here we're going to show you an example of these movements when he came into clinic. Good. Um, and I hope everyone could appreciate the very, very brief uh, twitches when he curled up and flexed that uh, right arm and grimaced on in the right face. And so his um, evaluation included a lumbar puncture and CSF analysis, which showed a slightly inflammatory uh, CSF with nine white blood cells. He had five unique oligoclonal bands, and his LGI-1 antibody was positive in the spinal fluid. Um, he had further serum testing in which that antibody was also positive in the serum. He had other markers of uh, demonstrating uh, underlying autoimmunity with markers of uh, thyroid antibodies being positive in the serum. Ultimately, his diagnosis uh, was LGI-1 autoimmune limbic encephalitis. Uh, here in this figure is this patient's uh, brain imaging. Uh, panel A shows the MRI on presentation. Um, here we see some T2 uh, or flare changes in the left uh, temporal lobe. It's a little abnormal on the right, but uh, left is a clearly... Uh, with increased signal. There is also what looks like left-sided swelling as there is asymmetry in those uh, hippocampi. Now, it's a little more obvious on the brain PET, which is in panel B, where you can see that clear yellow uh, dot that demonstrates FDG avidity um, in that left temporal lobe that matches up with the abnormalities that are a little more subtle that we see on the brain MRI. Now, panel C shows his MRI four months later after initiating second-line immune therapy 
And you can see here that he has had subsequent atrophy of that hippocampus. Um, he was treated with IV steroids in the hospital as well as IVIG. He was discharged on an oral prednisone taper. We met him uh, for the first time six months after his initial hospitalization when he followed up in clinic. He had a cognitive evaluation at the time uh, called a MOCA or Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and that demonstrated a seven out of 30. Normal would be considered anything over 27. Um, so because of his profound ongoing uh, cognitive impairment, as well as in that video, he was still having those facial brachial dystonic seizures, those abnormal movements, uh, he was treated with rituximab. And he had a remarkable recovery. At two and four months after the initiation of rituximab, his MOCA improved to 18 and then 26, which was almost normal. Um, essentially, he had a near complete recovery from his symptoms. The facial brachial dystonic seizures resolved completely. Um, and all he was left with at a year and a half was some minor residual cognitive impairment. Uh, notably, um, he also had a malignancy workup, which was unremarkable. Um, so like NMDA receptor encephalitis, LGI-1 has a very distinct, predictable phenotype. Uh, onset uh, can typically be seen with seizures, uh, either focal seizures or facial brachial dystonic seizures which um, on this slide is abbreviated FBDS. And that's that flexion movement and grimacing of the face that I showed you in the video. Um, in this pie chart here, highlighted in the green hues, uh, demonstrates uh, the seizure disorders that can be seen as the presenting symptom in the disease course. Uh, there is still, however, a large proportion of patients that present primarily with cognitive and behavioral changes at onset, and those are highlighted in the blue shades. There is a smaller subset uh, of patients that present with either sleep disturbance or peripheral nervous system symptoms, such as hyperexcitability, um, as their presenting symptom, and that's in the orange and red. Um, and then it's important to note that for patients that present only with facial brachial dystonic seizures before they develop the autoimmune limbic encephalitis, um, if, if we treat these patients early with appropriate immune therapy, we might actually avoid the development of encephalitis. Uh, furthermore, cases in which patients already have cognitive decline at the time of their presentation, these cases are often a little harder to treat and frequently require second line therapies, for example, using rituximab in this patient. Here we're going to move on to our fourth case. This is a 77-year-old man who developed cognitive changes and short-term memory issues. Um, and in addition to that, developed these abnormal involuntary movements of the mouth and tongue, which I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, he also had an unintentional weight loss of 50 pounds, and this was um, in the setting of without diarrhea. Uh, he first presented to the movement disorder clinic uh, when he was noted to have bradykinesia, uh, postural and action tremor, and oral buccal dyskinesias on exam, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. And then by 11 months, he had progressive cognitive and functional decline until he was essentially bedridden. I first met him uh, when he was actually uh, on hospice. And so these are, this is an example here of the movement disorders that we saw. You repeat after me, Methodist Episcopal. Methodist Episcopal. Uh-huh. And West Register Street. West. West Street. So they face His speech is hypophonic, yep. hard to hear. Hold it like that. Good. And he Shelf has these constant down. involuntary Shelf movements Shelf with Shelf sticking Shelf. out his tongue and, and moving that Shelf. mouth. Big taps. Just with the first finger and the thumb. Big and fast. As fast as you can. Keep going. Nope. Good. Now the other side. And it's quite obvious here on his right side, the decreased okay. amplitude and dysrhythmia of those foot taps. No. Yeah. No. Okay. Good. Push up on the chair. 
push up on the, the, yeah. the arms of the chair. Yeah. Good. Take your time. Are you dizzy? Okay, come on back. This is when he was admitted to the hospital at about 11 months after the onset of his neurologic symptoms. There you go. Good. Come up and stand. Same thing. I oh, know you got that. Thanks, Dr. Can you open and close? See? And so he had um, further workup. Uh, he had uh, imaging, so he had a brain MRI, which was normal. He had something called a DAT scan or a dopamine transporter scan, um, given the concern for a potential underlying uh, Parkinson's uh, disease in the setting of a neurodegenerative disorder, and that was negative. He had spinal fluid done at uh, nine months after his initial onset of neurologic symptoms which was essentially normal, just a very mild elevation in his protein um, and no evidence of inflammation with zero uh, white blood cells. When he was hospitalized at month 11, uh, he had repeat CSF studies, which demonstrated again, um, normal protein, normal white blood cell count. However, oligoclonal bands were done this time and he had five unique oligoclonal bands and an elevated IgG index, so some more subtle signs of inflammation here. And then he had the autoimmune encephalopathy evaluation that was sent over to the Mayo Clinic, and later, initial testing was negative, uh, but later came back with his um, IFA demonstrating an atypical immune staining, um, which triggered novel research autoantibody testing. And eventually this led to the diagnosis um, and the finding of the DPPX antibody in his spinal fluid. Uh, he had a malignancy workup done looking for cancer, which was essentially negative, included a CAT scan of the body as well as a PET scan of the body. He had um, testing done on the blood that demonstrated a monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis uh, that was caught on cytology and flow. However, hematology has been involved in his case and he has had further workup with no evidence of a lymphoma. So his diagnosis was consistent with DPPX associated autoimmune encephalitis. He was treated um, in the hospital uh, with five days of steroids and plasma exchange for a total of five days. He got started uh, right away in the hospital on an induction dose of rituximab, which was a thousand milligrams. And then two weeks later, another a thousand. And he continues on maintenance dosing um, and he got another a thousand milligrams six months later. And at that point, this is the follow up that we have at nine months. Then touch, touch your, your left, left ear, ear and, and then stick, stick out your tongue. tongue. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you do it bigger? Uh, okay. And how about on this side? Okay. okay. And now can you open and close your fists? Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. And then put your arms out in front of you like this. Okay. And then put it in front of you like this. Okay. And then now we're going to do some tapping on it. Like this. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Depends on how long I walk. <laughs> how long? 
hope um, you know you can appreciate in that video uh, he had he started gaining weight. He overall just looks healthier, um, but he had improvement, although not complete resolution by nine months of these of the facial um, uh, dyskinesias. Uh, he was much better with his finger taps and foot taps uh, with uh, resolution, really, of his bradykinesia. Um, and his cognitive status was remarkably better. Um, I don't know if anyone picked it up, but on the first video, he was walking with his walker in the air, which kind of spoke to his um, disinhibition and, and, and cognitive deficits and uh, follows complex commands during this video just remarkably better. Um, just to put it in, in context, we did some bedside cognitive evaluations with him again with a MOCA. Um, he was unable to complete this in the hospital because of his cognitive impairment being so bad uh, prior to immune therapy. But after, after getting rituximab, he came back into clinic at two months. This was eight out of 30, still not great, uh, but better than zero. And by nine months, he was at 18 out of 30. So just doing remarkably well. And he actually continues to improve uh, to this day. Uh, I still follow with him in clinic. He is now living on his own with his wife and participates in all of his activities of daily living. So just a remarkable improvement uh, from where he was. Uh, so clinical features of DPPX associated uh, autoimmune encephalitis include this prodrome of unexplained weight loss. This is pretty common. It can happen in the setting of having profound diarrhea or even without diarrhea. It often has this very protracted course and resembles a neurodegenerative course. Um, particularly in this series of nine patients, the median disease progression was over eight months, very similar to the case that I presented here. He got to 11 months uh, until this was recognized as an autoimmune disorder. Um, mo most patients have cognitive dysfunction. Uh, other common symptoms include neurologic hyperexcitability. So this includes movement disorders, myoclonus, uh, something called hypercomplexia or a hyperstartle reflex. So think about hearing a really loud noise and being hyperexcitable and jumping, uh, tremors, uh, seizures. And uh, this also includes like the video I showed you, these oral buccal dyskinesias. Uh, sometimes the presentation may also resemble um, another disorder, stiff person syndrome spectrum disorder, or PERM, also known as progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. Here we're going to wrap up our last case of a pediatric case. This is a 15-year-old girl that she developed progressive left-sided motor deficits, and this progressed over the course of one month. Uh, here on the brain MRI, you can see uh, hemiatrophy in the right cerebellum. Uh, when you compare that to the left, you could see much more, especially on the T2 images, you could see this white uh, area, which demonstrates um, your CSF, and that's shrinking down in the brain, so we can see that. There is one spot, you could see it on the flare image uh, on the right of a uh, T2 hyperintense lesion uh, right under the fourth ventricle. Um, sorry, I don't have an arrow there, that, but that's perfect. That's where it is. Um, I can promise you she did not have any other lesions like that in the rest of the brain. I do not show it here, uh, but uh, there was no evidence of anything that looked like multiple sclerosis or demyelinating disease uh, otherwise in the brain. She had uh, CSF studies done, which showed inflammation in her spinal fluid. She had 23 white blood cells. She also had 13 unique oligoclonal bands. She had a very thorough infectious workup, uh, given that this was pretty rapidly progressive over a month. This included uh, CSF testing for, for next gen or next generation sequencing, uh, which was done at UCSF. And, and again, that was negative. She had the autoimmune encephalopathy evaluation um, at Mayo Clinic and her spinal fluid, which later came back and revealed an unclassified antibody. So 
nothing was picked up on the standard cell-based assays, but the uh, immunohistochemistry um, uh, screen did pick up an unusual pattern. Uh, she had a perineoplastic or malignancy workup, which was done and negative that included a whole body PET CT. Interestingly enough, three weeks before her neurologic presentation, she did have a pilomyxoma uh, removed from her neck, which was thought to be unrelated. Um, she was started on uh, IV steroids and IVIG uh, when she first presented. Unfortunately, she developed side effects of the IVIG, including aseptic meningitis. Um, so she couldn't tolerate that moving forward due to the headaches. She was started on rituximab um, and her neurologic symptoms stabilized uh, and actually to some degree actually improved. She was treated with two cycles. Uh, so a total of a year essentially of rituximab and she is doing well. Um, she only at this point has some very mild, persistent left-sided ataxia. Now, two years later, her unclassified antibody was given a name, and this was the adapter protein 3B2 antibody, or AP3B2. And um, here on this slide shows a staining uh, pattern that is common with this antibody, where it diffusely reacted with Purkinje neurons, uh, myenteric plexus, cerebellar granular cell synapses. Um, so our patient serum showed this pattern which led to the discovery of this novel autoantibody. Now this has been published uh, with a case report or a series of 10 uh, patients and the AB, sorry, AP3B2, turns into alphabet soup with these antibodies, um, was identified in a series of 10 patients. And this was out of 616,025 patients screened with this unclassified synaptic antibody that mimics the staining pattern of amphipycin. Um, this antibody was confirmed in this group of patients with uh, cell-based assay as well as Western uh, blot testing. Out of this group of 10 patients with this positive antibody, 60% of patients were women, um, and the median age of onset was 42 years old. All patients had a rapidly progressive gait ataxia like our patient, although most patients, unlike this case, had no improvement with immune therapy, but after the initiation of immune therapy, it seemed to stop the progression. And interestingly, no other cases in this series really only had hemicerebellar atrophy, uh, but notably our patient was much younger than what was seen. Uh, so clearly uh, more research needs to go into this particular antibody syndrome. Um, here we're gonna wrap up looking at just how to make the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. So we already reviewed the clinical criteria for NMDA receptor encephalitis. But there are proposed guidelines um, for diagnostic criteria of possible autoimmune encephalitis. The diagnosis can be made when all three of the following criteria have been met. This includes subacute onset of these symptoms, again, defined as less than three months, and that is of altered mental status and at least uh, one of the following positive diagnostic tests. Um, so, you need to have either a new focal neurologic deficit, new onset seizures, again, not in the setting of um, an underlying seizure disorder, inflammatory CSF, and again, that's defined as greater than five white blood cells, or an MRI uh, that suggests features of encephalitis. And then to meet these full diagnostic criteria, you must have reasonable exclusion of alternative causes. Uh, for example, ruling out infectious etiologies as a cause of encephalitis, such as HSB. This figure summarizes the workflow for autoimmune encephalitis in terms of looking for these diagnostic features. Uh, oftentimes, an autoimmune etiology is suspected based on clinical clues. This includes a subacute onset, as we discussed, a fluctuating course, a uh, personal or family history of autoimmune disease or autoimmunity, uh, systemic markers of autoimmune disease or autoimmunity, or a history of uh, a prior cancer or current uh, malignancy. So studies often include CSF analysis, 
Serum studies, again, looking for markers of underlying autoimmunity, such as thyroid antibodies or rheumatologic antibodies. Uh, an example here is given uh, an ANA. Uh, EEG to evaluate for any evidence of underlying seizures or abnormal electrical activity, uh, and an MRI. Now, if the MRI is normal, sometimes further imaging with a brain PET scan can be helpful, such as our case presented earlier of NMDA receptor encephalitis. If an antibody is identified, it can be helpful to direct malignancy screening as some antibodies have a strong association with particular cancers. For example, with NMDA receptor encephalitis, you want to make sure, especially in a woman, that you rule out and evaluate for a teratoma. So you want to do the appropriate malignancy screen that you need uh, to evaluate and exonerate those ovaries. So with that, I, I want to end uh, back on this slide and revisit the slide, emphasizing again, there are many antibodies identified in autoimmune encephalitis and in the field of autoimmune neurology. Notably, not all antibodies are commercially available for testing, and there are some antibodies that have yet to be discovered. So this can certainly have an impact on your clinical and diagnostic workup, which was emphasized in our fifth case in our pediatric patients with autoimmune cerebellar ataxia. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to conclude uh, and leave you with, with this information. Novel autoantibodies are being discovered every year. As you can see, the field has exploded. Um, and these autoantibodies can serve as biomarkers for neurologic autoimmunity, and it's sometimes cancer, and they have different responses to treatment. The absence of antibody does not always exclude neurologic autoimmunity. And if this is suspected, treatments and cancer screening should be initiated regardless of the antibody status. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. PK, for this wonderful presentation. I think everybody can appreciate uh, the talk that you gave, and I'm sure many clinicians out there have a lot of questions. Uh, so Aya will be relaying that to you during the panel discussion. So again, if you have additional questions, please do type them in the chat box. Um, just one takeaway message, like Dr. PK said, there's been a lot of antibodies identified, but there's still a lot of autoantibodies that are yet to be identified. And we from Euroimmune are heavily focused on our R&D efforts to identify such autoantibodies. So we completely feel with you and we hope we can discover more autoantibodies. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. All right, so without uh, further ado, so the next presenter will be Dr. Nades. Um, Dr. Nades is a clinician scientist and a medical consultant. Dr. Nades is a board certified internist with subspecialty in certification uh, in rheumatology. In 2006, he joined the Quest Diagnostics at Nicholas Institute as the medical director of the immunology and R&D department. Here, he focused on new assay development and oversight of reference laboratory clinical testing. More recently, he was the director of scientific affairs at Euromian US, where he saw, uh, oversaw collaborations, scientific communications, and publications. Thank you so much, Dr. Nades. Um, so uh, we are excited to have your presentation. Immune and uh, to follow an excellent presentation by Dr. Piquet. Um, my uh, disclosures uh, briefly and next slide. So what I wanted to do in follow-up to Dr. Piquet's talk is describe the methods used to detect autoantibodies in autoimmune encephalitis cases discussed and to explain the rationale for screening for multiple autoantibodies in autoimmune neurological diseases as Dr. Piquet and uh, Dr. Van uh, Kataraman introduced. So the testing strategy was uh, developed by consensus uh, in a group of key opinion leaders in the field of uh, autoimmune neurology uh, as published by uh, Dr. Grouse, 
the approach was to first perform indirect immunofluorescence uh, as a screening on a neuronal tissue, preferably an array of neuronal tissues. And then uh, based on the pattern uh, determined or suggested to look for reactivity with specific target antigens, either through membrane-based systems and immunoblots, line blots, or Western blots, or transfected cells, typically HEC293 cells that have been made to express the antigen target. So this is your, your typical um, tissue IFA. Uh, tissue is placed on a slide. Uh, partially uh, fixed, um, and then patient serum or CSF is overlaid, followed by a GOAT anti-human IgG, which has been conjugated to fluorescein, which under appropriate irradiation uh, by light uh, at, at uh, 494 nanometers wavelengths gives you a green fluorescence, and hence you see green fluorescence staining, identifying where the antibody is. What your immune has done, which has been a, I think, an advance in the field, has been to develop biochip technology, which is proprietary to your immune. Um, a tissue section is placed on a glass cover slip, and the secret sauce, if you will, is the methodology for fixing that and sticking that tissue to the cover slip, which leaves the uh, antigens relatively intact. Then um, the slide can be looked at, uh, examined by a technician under a microscope and a virtual grid overlaid. The, the technician can then go through and look at each sector, each grid, and decide if it meets quality control. Same thing can be done with cells that have been transfected with an appropriate uh, receptor and placed, cells placed and fixed on the slide. Again, the same uh, grid overlaid and the same examination, picking out appropriate chips that meet uh, quality control. So this is an example of a tissue that has been examined, and you can see the virtual grids and the image uh, captured, and those sectors that were felt not to meet uh, quality control were X'd out. And this leads to good quality of the tissues. Now, the chips, the chips that can then be placed into slides, and you can place multiple chips into a given microscope well, which improves laboratory efficiency and also allows you to look at multiple tissues under the same um, testing conditions. Patient serum or CSF is then overlaid uh, in the well and GOAT anti-human IgG conjugated to fluorescein uh, added as a second step after each step uh, of washes. And so this allows the um, uh, uh, antibody in the patient serum or CSF to be identified. So once the tissue has been shown to show a particular staining pattern that um, results from the distribution of the of the antibody target in the in the neuronal tissue one can then uh, direct further testing to attempt to confirm uh, a monospecific antibody um, and one can do that by single analyte transfected cell substrates in uh, and cell-based assays or it can use membrane-based systems, Western blot, line blot, or use radioimmunoassays. Um, we're going to focus on the cell-based assays today because the antibodies that Dr. Piquet presented are synaptic surface receptor antibodies um, for the most part and uh, are best tested in, for monospecific assays and cell-based assays. So typically, um, as many of you already know, this is the wonders of technology that was developed in the 1980s and 1990s in that an antigen is identified the uh, DNA uh, is uh, synthesized that corresponds to the antigen. Uh, it's placed into a plasmid. Um, the plasmid then is used to transfect uh, a cell, typically HEC293 cells, which then express the antigen on the surface. Cells can be fixed, placed on a slide, patient serum or CSF added, followed by a fluorescinated conjugate antibody is second step. So this can be done, the mosaic can be created much like for tissues, it can be done with individual cell-based assays. And so the cell -based, uh, surface receptors are best presented in this context because they're presented in the 
surface membrane. Uh, a number of targets that tend to have more internal protein before they get to the uh, membrane can be slightly permeabilized as in NMDAR1 uh, targets. And a number of these can be transfected. And you see I've, I've emboldened uh, those uh, antibodies that are uh, were discussed uh, today uh, in the case uh, series. So those can be placed in a mosaic. And the tissue and CBA mosaic imaging can also be um, automated both in terms of the uh, slide preparation and also in terms of image capture, which helps decrease uh, inter-observer variability and allows for records and um, uh, in, in internal laboratory uh, training and uh, proficiency uh, enhancement. And so this is an example of a number of different tissues, and one looks for the pattern of staining and the distribution of the different tissues, as well as within the tissues, the different structures that are stained. Next slide. So here's an example of an array, uh, compliments from uh, Dr. Wendinger and colleagues, looking at a number of uh, autoimmune encephalitides uh, in which uh, tissue is stained, and you can see hippocampus across the first row and then cerebellum. And then above, you can see the various different uh, antibodies that are present in those individual cases. And what is of note is that you can see, for example, hippocampus staining, which between different antibodies can be difficult to differentiate. And so um, the um, one then suspects that there's a synaptic uh, uh, membrane target given the distribution. And so one then does a, a cell-based assay mosaic. And you can see that, in, as you see at the pointer, the NMDAR1 antibody case lights up the NMDAR1 transfected HEC293 cells, but not the other um, cells in that row that are part of the mosaic. So you have an internal uh, negative control for the assay. The same you can see for LGI-1. Uh, in that instance, that patient uh, shown in the uh, fourth uh, column, the uh, CBA uh, lights up uh, the cell stain, representing staining of the LGI-1 that has been expressed, but not the other um, um, uh, CBAs in the mosaic. So there is a mosaic that is available that captures um, the antibodies that uh, Dr. Piquet described. Um, this is a urimmune uh, product. The, uh, the AP3B2, as Dr. Piquet pointed out, uh, is not uh, yet commercially available, uh, although um, you know, one hopes that it will be soon. Uh, Euromune did participate in the uh, uh, study that uh, described the AP3B2 as part of their uh, UFO project, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. And here's this sample, the, the staining. So when you look at patients, uh, they don't always follow the rules. And as Dr. Piquet has pointed out, as we've understood more about autoimmune encephalitis and this family of antibody, autoantibodies, in many cases, there's no underlying tumor found. And therefore, these autoantibodies are often associated with idiopathic autoimmune brain disease. In a number of cases, such as NMDAR1, they may be post-infectious. But here is a very interesting study that was performed in the Euroimmune Clinical Immunology Laboratory, the reference laboratory, in which uh, there were uh, 16,741 samples that were sent for testing in this study. Now, what they uh, did was to test what the clinicians had asked for, but then to use the samples and test for everything else that they had, either in the commercial lab or in the R&D pipeline. And when they did this, they found at least one positive antibody in 13.6% of the cases that they received, uh, two or more positive antibodies in 0.5% percent. So it's not common, but some people are unfortunate and have more than one antibody. But what was, I think, most interesting was that the samples were positive 
in 53.4% of the time for what was requested by the clinician, but in nearly half the time, 46.6%, uh, it was positive for something other than what was requested. So we may not be as good, uh, as, good as we are clinically. Uh, there clearly is, you know, we're dealing with complex uh, clinical presentations, and uh, we're learning more and uh, about which antibodies might be associated with which syndromes, and some antibodies may be associated with multiple syndromes, as we see for Hugh, for example, as Dr. Piquet pointed out, both a uh, cerebellar degenerative disease as well as uh, cases of peripheral sensory loss. And so, when you looked at the antibodies um, that were identified, um, at the time that this was uh, performed uh, in uh, several years ago, about 22% of the antibodies were not in your typical commercial space. But more importantly, um, even if we looked at all the antibodies that we knew about, there are still 13% of the time uh, tissue staining that was not associated with a specific antibody, what we affectionately called unidentified fluorescent object or UFO. And as part of our UFO, as part of the UFO uh, project at uh, Your Immune, uh, scientists and collaborations with uh, academic collaborators uh, will look for um, attempt to identify what those antibodies are. And in the case of AP3B2 antibody, that was a UFO uh, candidate, and indeed uh, that was identified. And so as Dr. Piquet has pointed out, we expect to see uh, more antibodies uh, as we move uh, forward. New pair, next, next slide. So um, as I noticed in the chat, there was a question, serum or CSF, in many of the intracellular antigens, which are real more biomarkers of uh, rather than pathogenic in themselves, although they are target for cytotoxicity, cytotoxic T cells, um, these can be often identified in serum. But the antibodies we looked at today um, it's recommended that we use both CSF and serum, as Dr. Piquet points out, because these are surface antigens. These are pathogenic. And we have learned from NMDAR encephalitis that um, whilst this antibody can be found in serum, in about 14% of cases, it's only found in the CSF. So it's important to look at both CSF and serum. There was another question about uh, thyroperoxidase antibodies in CSF, and one of the advantages of CSF, as well as uh, completeness of examination, is that um, CSF usually does not have uh, thyroperoxidase antibodies or your typical antinuclear antibodies that are seen in patients who might have lupus, for example. You tend not to see those while they may be in serum. So it's very important to know your lab um, and know, know your lab and know what antibodies they test for when they do an a, a autoimmune encephalitis panel, know what methods are used, and know what is always tested and what is reflexed and when. And uh, there may be clinically relevant positive antibodies that can be found that may not be ordered. And uh, it's helpful to know that your laboratory is willing to advise uh, the clinician that there may be uh, tissue staining um, uh, uh, without an identified specific antibody present, or there, there may have been an antibody uh, that is positive that was not ordered so that you provide as much information to the clinicians from the laboratory as possible. So um, with that, um, I thank you. And, and given our time, I'll return control back to I, uh, Dr. Venkataraman and uh, have an opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Nades. That was a really exciting, uh, but a brief overview of how we can support uh, accurate and reliable diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, again, thank you for presenting the mosaics that are available and also mentioning that we are heavily involved in discovery of new autoantibodies, which, as Dr. PK mentioned, is something that's currently ongoing.
So I hope everyone in the audience um, had a, a great session uh, from Dr. PK talking about the clinical presentation and from Dr. Nades, uh, who helped you understand if you're a clinician or a laboratory, how you can diagnose such conditions. So um, I know we have a, about 20, 25 minutes left. So I want to give this uh, session to the panel discussion so that Dr. PK and Dr. Nades can answer all your questions that is being typed in the chat box. So for that, I'm going to give control uh, to Aya Ilhaj. Uh, who is my associate, and she will relay all your questions to the speakers. So thank you again, everybody. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so thank you everyone who has submitted questions to Dr. PK and Dr. Nades. Um, again, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, or you can email us at scientificaffairs at yourimmune.us. We've received over 30 questions already, so we'll try to get through as much as we can right now. If your question does not get answered, we will get back to you through email. So we'll go ahead and start with a question uh, by Dr. Vincent Ricciuti. And this question is for Dr. PK. Uh, is there a study showing the superior sensitivity of CSF versus serum detection of anti-NMDAR antibodies? And a follow-up question is how much, uh, how much antibodies in the CSF or serum contribute to the final diagnosis? Uh, so there is data to, to support that uh, testing is more sensitive and specific for NMDA receptor antibodies in the CSF. I don't have the study off the top of my head, Dr. Nades. I don't know if there's anything from the laboratory side that, that you have off the top of your head. Well, obviously, you know, sensitivities depend uh, a lot on how you actually set up the assay. So depending on um, the you know, dilutions uh, at which you test uh, of, of the patient serum or CSF, remember they're also very different in terms of the uh, complexity of the protein matrix that is in those samples, as well as the concentration of the conjugate. But I think if you optimize uh, both CSF and uh, serum uh, in the laboratory, a uh, number of investigators have found um, CSF positivity when serum has been negative. And so it, you know, I think the takeaway message is that the CSF is, is more sensitive um, and that um, there's value in doing uh, both uh, serum and CSF. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Chloe. This one is for Dr. Nates, but Dr. PK, feel free to um, chime in. Uh, we regularly observe atypical staining of Purkinje cells not confirmed in the French Reference Center. What is the value of these staining and what do you know about differences between tissues from different species, primate versus rat, for example? So uh, your immune uses human primate. Um, you know, are we men or are we mice, um, as they would sometimes say? Um, there are differences. Um, and um, I, you know, our, I have not seen a published study, but our sense from uh, the reference laboratory is that um, it, it tends to be a bit easier to see patterns in the non-human primate tissues as opposed to rodent tissues. Um, having said that, um, you know, we, we suspect that um, the uh, primate tissues are a bit better. When you look at Purkinje cells per se, um, you know, one of the first Purkinje cell um, autoantibodies identified was Yo or uh, Purkinje PCNA1. Um, and, and that gives you a very distinct pattern staining of, of, of the body of the cell, very little of the dendrites. There are a number of other Purkinje cell antibodies that have been identified, uh, such as ARG-26, um, uh, if I'm remembering the, the number designation correctly, but also ITPR1 um, and still others, PCA2. Um, that um, are part of the Purkinje cell staining. The 
staining on tissue has some subtleties in which dendrites get stained in some of them. Um, and the nature, the granularity of the staining may be a little bit different. But the ITPR in the ARG uh, row 26 is available um, to um, uh, as uh, cell-based assays that are just making their way into the commercial uh, space. So there are other Purkinje cell antibodies that are there and others that are probably yet to be discovered. Perfect, thank you. Uh, this question is from Richard Dunham. Uh, regarding LGI-1 or other limbic encephalitis cases, is it only FDG PET limbic increased activity or do you get hypometabolism as well? This one is for Dr. Piquet, but anyone can answer. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, actually, there's there's various findings you can see on the PET, and there was a there was a great um, publication out uh, by the Hopkins Group uh, with Joe Probasco looking at uh, common findings that you see with autoimmune encephalitis, and really, actually, the most common one that was seen was hypometabolism. But you can also have hypermetabolism or a mix of hypo and hypermetabolism. There are certain antibodies that are a little more notorious to causing certain patterns like NMDA uh, with that gradient that I showed in the presentation. Okay, thank you. And this question is from Kimberly DeHathis. Um, Dr. Piquet, have you seen any anti-NMDAR encephalitis develop after COVID-19 infection? I personally have not, um, but I, I am aware of a recently published case report of that. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, other post-infectious uh, processes uh, in our hospitals, such as ADEM or acute uh, disseminated encephalomyelitis after COVID-19. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Nades, uh, this question is from Doris. Uh, when cell surface antibodies such as NMDA are suspected, is there added value to also perform the IIF on cerebellum instead of only on the hippocampus? Well, I think you know what has been recommended by a number of key opinion leaders in the clinical space in this area has been to look at as many neurological tissues as possible. Um, you know, if you're looking for NMDAR1, <coughs> Um, it, it's important to look at cerebellum as well because you do see some um, uh, staining, and you and you know with the and the pattern hippocampus as well as cerebellum not only not only helps you confirm NMDAR one, but also helps direct you to consider other antibodies when. When the laboratory receives a sample, um, you really don't know what the clinical picture is typically. And so to look broadly is, is perhaps the most prudent. Okay. Uh, this question is for Dr. PK uh, by Golson Ackman Demir. Uh, how do you proceed with seronegative patients with no hints regarding inflammatory pathology, such as normal CSF, normal MR? Yeah, that's that's a great question and a clinical challenge every day. Um, I, I mean, this is why it's so exciting to see this plethora of antibodies being discovered and new biomarkers to really uh, help guide uh, our diagnostic workup. However, that's why those clinical criteria that I did show um, kind of help guide you when you think about um, clues to underlying autoimmune disease that you have these subacute onsets, you have these fluctuating courses that differentiate things from this maybe faster onset progressive course that we see with infectious etiologies. Um, and why you use the clues such as PET scan, EEG, those type of di diagnostic tests to help you in the setting of a non-inflammatory CSF. And I do want to say when you do your CSF studies, one thing I often like, commonly see missed is checking for things like oligoclonal bands and IgG index. Because uh, for that case in DPPX, that was missed the first time around. 
and not checked. And he looked like he had essentially a normal CSF. But when you look for oligoclonal bands that are, that's abnormal. So looking for those subtle things can sometimes help give you clues clinically. Okay, question for Dr. Nates. This question is from Francisco Vera and Raquel Munoz also had the same question. Is it necessary to detect NMDAR antibodies both on fixed cells and on tissue sections, such as hippocampus and cerebellum, in order to report antibodies as positive? And what happens if they are clearly positive only on transfected cells, but not on the tissue? Well, it, if you find that it's only positive on tissue on cell-based assay but not on tissue um, you'd have to step back and ask um, how the testing was done um, so for example what was the titer um, the amount of uh, an mdar target in a transfected cell is probably maybe a bit more than on tissue and there may be other issues in, in tissue in terms of how the testing is performed. So for example, if a blocking agent is used um, uh, as typically done on sample on tissue to block out routine anti-nuclear antibodies, for example, you may need to do that um, detection at a higher titer. Um, and you may be able to use a lower titer um, um, on your NMDR cell-based assay. So that may contribute to a difference. So the devil may be in the details and you may need to look a little closer about how um, the laboratory is performing that ass that, those assays in order to try to understand why you would have a negative um, tissue uh, staining, but a positive NMDAR1. Okay. And this question is from Pune Dokuhaki. Uh, for Dr. PK, could you uh, comment on the utility of checking for a full autoantibody panel in young patients with encephalitis presentation early in the course of disease? Um, and is there an algorithmic approach to do the testing that you would recommend? Um, so I think this was alluded to a little bit earlier. I mean, with, with your young patients, NMDA is the most common antibody that you find. Uh, but, you know, I still think it's essential to send off the panels, including both serum and CSF and sending off, you know, as, as inclusive as you can be with those panels. Uh, sometimes we see things come back on the immunofluorescence assay that, that picks up an unclassified antibody or a novel autoantibody that hasn't been discovered yet. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the advantage of, of thinking broadly. And Dr. Needs already alluded to in his talk, 46% of the time we're wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Needs, this question is for you. Um, how does the Euromune tissue array system compare with flow cytometry based methods for detection of specificity of antibodies on transfected cells? Well, I think, I think there are a couple of elements. I think they're, they compare well. Um, um, also, there for most laboratories, there's an ease of uh, operational um, uh, logistics um, um, and ease of performance um, using um, the cell-based assays. The slides that are in the refrigerator, you can, they've been fixed. They have good quality control. Um, they don't vary from time to time. Um, and you can pull them out of the refrigerator and run them in an assay that is performed the same way every time. Uh, flow cytometry has more parameters to control. You're working with cells that you need to grow. Um, so there's more variation that you have to be aware of. It's much more, um, uh, I think, challenging uh, to perform consistently a flow-based assay. And uh, this question is from Dr. Marvin Fritzler. Uh, for Dr. PK, do you report atypical staining of the brain chip? And if so, how would you word the report? Um, so I don't actually have a laboratory where I, um, we do a lot of our send out to Mayo. So maybe I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Nades if there's a way that they want to, you know, put that in their report if there's an atypical unclassified antibody. Yeah, I, I think 
I think it, what laboratories struggle with is the the notion under um, in the United States at least uh, centers for Medicare and Medicaid studies that you know a laboratory should only report what is ordered. So I think it's uh, incumbent upon the laboratory to make clear that if you order a tissue screen, that uh, you you will get <coughs> reports of the specific patterns that uh, are known and defined, but there will be room for comment. Uh, if you find something atypical uh, that is, is not confirmed. I, I think the most information you can give the clinician, um, it's the most helpful. So I think you, the report could certainly uh, help the clinician by including a, a comment uh, section that might say, you know, we've seen this particular pattern of staining, which is not associated uh, or confirmed with a particular antibody that is suggested, other antibodies may be present, or we see an atypical staining pattern. I think that's helpful. Um, the more you can communicate uh, with, have communication between the laboratory and the clinician, uh, I think the better able the laboratory can help the clinician. And just to add to that, as a clinician, when, when I do get um, suspicion that there's something abnormal there, I oftentimes am either emailing or picking up the phone, mm -hmm. kind of going through what the clinical scenario is and what I'm suspicious for, and having that conversation is huge. Yeah. Okay. This question is from Lisa Lauder. Um, she has a patient who is six years out from the diagnosis of of LGI-1, only being treated with steroids and IVIG and on daily steroids. Would rituximab still be of help for this patient? So, so that's kind of a tough one, uh, just because I'm not seeing the, the patient in front of me, but uh, LGI-1 uh, encephalitis is one of those encephalitides that has a tendency to relapse. Uh, about 37% uh, of been reported in the literature to relapse. And, and the longest time I've seen is four and a half years. The longest uh, report is eight years. Uh, but I mean, it would, it would really kind of take a clinical assessment to see what, what's active, what's still ongoing, and does immunotherapy at that point make sense to continue? Okay, and this is a follow-up question about the first case, Dr. PK. Um, since you did not give methylprednisolone um, after uh, methylprednisolone treatment, you used rituximab, and the healing process was long, uh, what did you do until rituximab has an effect since it won't take effect immediately? Did you give IVIG monthly or something else? Uh, that's a great question. I do have to have a little bit of a disclosure that first case was in 2012. Uh, so it's a little dated. We know more now. Um, and that was actually a case when I was a neurology resident. Um, that being said, in my practice currently, uh, if there is some degree of prolonged or ongoing symptoms, it is not uncommon that I will overlap uh, you know, more chronic therapy like rituximab with something like pulse dose IV steroids or, or IVIG. So that is, that is not an unreasonable approach. Okay, the next question is from Cruz Walker. Uh, is the DPPX patient's apparent change in weight related to his neurological improvement as well? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. And the answer is Probably. Uh, so DPPX actually interferes with the myenteric plexus. Uh, there's receptors there. So the, the uh, neuro gut communication, which probably leads to the weight loss and sometimes what we see with diarrhea. So absolutely that weight gain is a reflection of his recovery. And funny is not enough. His wife actually measures his weight to this day, like almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I could add that um, representative of the impact on the myenteric plexus, DPPX antibodies stain the neurons in the myenteric plexus. And so the one of the advantages of a urimmune uh, tissue mosaic is that it can include small intestine that allows you to identify um, antibodies like DPX and allows you to differentiate antibodies like Q and RE. Um, by looking at not just neuronal tissues, but non-neuronal tissues as, as well. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, this question is from Ilana Heckler for Dr. PK. Are there clinical symptoms that might point to a bacterial or viral pathogen as a cause of encephalitis, or that could be used to distinguish between encephalitis caused by autoimmunity versus bacteria? Uh, yeah, so so normally the the clinical courses um, actually gives you a clue whether or not you're dealing with an infectious etiology versus an autoimmune etiology of encephalitis. Uh, typically, the time course and progression of the symptoms with infectious etiologies, you have a little more rapid onset, uh, progressive over hours to days, uh, whereas in these autoimmune encephalitis can be a little more insidious with that subacute progression over three months. Um, also in autoimmune encephalitis, you can see this fluctuation, good days and bad days, whereas when you're dealing with infectious etiologies, it's pretty rapid in a, in a steady decline. So the clinic, there's definitely clinical clues. Um, obviously, when you do your, your workup, there's additional radiographic clues that you can see um, as well as when you do your CSF analysis, looking at um, infectious markers in the CSF, as well as looking at your profile, your CSF profile, so looking at the white blood cells, what type of white blood cells, uh, protein, um, and glucose. Okay, this question is from Alana Yi. Uh, for Dr. PK or Dr. Nates, are there characteristic EEG abnormalities suggestive of autoimmune encephalitis besides the delta brushes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And on that chart um, of that kind of diaphragm that I worked through, you know, how do you do the diagnosis? Um, having an EEG on there can be abnormal, and that can include just frank seizures or more subtle focal changes, uh, spikes or slowing in a particular area like the temporal lobe can give you a clue of um, dysfunction there. Uh, funny enough, the, the delta brush wads uh, pretty well recognized in NMDA receptor encephalitis. It's actually relatively uncommon, more along the lines of maybe a third of patients with that. And really in the adult population is where it's, um, you know, more likely a, a pathogenic uh, or a um, pathognomonic uh, marker of NMDA. Perfect. Okay. And I know we're approaching the time here, so we'll just take one more question. Uh, is there a reason why women are more affected compared to men for autoimmune encephalitis? And is there a genetic component associated with AE? So I'd have to say in autoimmune disease in general, uh, women tend to be more impacted. It's, it's more common in women. Although when you look at specific autoimmune encephalitides, um, it, it doesn't always follow the rule. So for NMDA receptor encephalitis, much more commonly seen in, in women um, and, and, and young girls. Uh, but when you look at things like LGI-1 encephalitis, it's actually more common in men. Uh, so I think there's still a lot to be learned in that arena. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. PK and Dr. Nades. Uh, so I know we have about a minute left. And uh, if your question was not answered, we will definitely get back to you through email. And at this time, I will pass it back to uh, Dr. Aishu Venkat to close us off here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and also answering all the interesting questions. I think the questions keep coming in. So we're going to take that offline and send you the remaining questions directly via email so that we can have the other questions answered as well. Um, just also a note, which I, I saw in the chat box, there are a lot of questions on patterns on the tissue substrates, especially like Purkinje cells, et cetera. So if you have such questions on your tissue substrate, please do not hesitate to email us uh, in the scientific affairs ID provided with the images that you're seeing and, um, you know, the titer, uh, what sample it is, et cetera. If it's the identified, that works the best. And we'll help you understand a little bit more on what pattern we are seeing. Um, as Dr. Nades explained, we have at least about over about 30 years understanding these um, autoimmune neurology patterns on various tissue substrates. So uh, once again, our uh, email ID is on the chat box, so please do not hesitate to email us with other questions as well as patterns. So with that, I think we come to the end of our session uh, right on time. It's 12.30 Eastern time. Uh, before we close, I just wanted to let you all know that uh, we have an upcoming neurology webinar series, again, focusing on autoimmune neurology on February 25th. 
Uh, the speaker will be Dr. Robert Kadish, and he's also going to be talking a little bit more on perineoplastic cases and also seronegative cases for autoimmune encephalitis. So I know there were a lot of questions today on seronegative cases, so we are going to be addressing that. And Dr. Nades is going to come back to that presentation and also address how, um, as Euroimmune, we address seronegative cases and how we can help you out uh, identifying this new autoantibody. We sincerely hope you can join us again next time. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.